Good morning. Welcome to our seminar. I'm John De Beer from Schlange and Belito, and I'll be sharing with you uh, missions in your workplace. But before we begin, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I want to thank you so much for your love, for your kindness, and that we have this technology where we can come and still interact with, with each other. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will fill our hearts with the knowledge of your will regarding this topic. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have two sessions, about half an hour each, and I'm going to speak to you in the first session. We're going to look at general principles about missions at the workplace. The second one, um, we're going to talk about different population groups, different religious groups, how to maybe approach meeting them. I won't have enough time to go through all the, the differences in the religions and uh, what they believe, but just an approach from a Christian perspective. Under general principles, let's get into it. If you're in a business or a practice, by definition, people are coming to you for a service. That means they have a need. If they have a need, you can develop a relationship with them. And that's the key to missions in the city. Make friends. First of all, in a medical practice, for example, people come in. And once you spend a bit more time than was allocated for your consult, or with the customer, it allows you then to explore further needs. Everyone has needs in their family life, in their financial, in their health life, and they will express those needs once your relationship gets to the level that it is intended to get. And that's when you can offer advice. To quote scripture really helps. If you give someone an advice like, cast your cares upon him, or if you lack wisdom, ask of God, and he will give to you without reproach. There's a beautiful promises. This is the hope that we have, that he poured out his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that was given us. We've got to memorize these verses, these promises, and just have one line as to encourage people. So where there's a business, there's a need. The big thing is to create the relationship there that God intended for you to have with that person before you can reach them. Memorize verses. That's our second point under general principles. If you memorize certain verses, certain promises, you'll be able to reach out to these people. And um, it's one thing that we did when I was growing up is the memory verse at Sabbath school. And we've kind of lost that approach uh, in our young people and especially amongst our adults. Let's read our memory verse out of the lesson study today. It was a memory verse. We should have uh, recited it rather than read it. So I'd encourage you to start taking little promises and just memorize a few every year, just so that you can plant a seed where, where it is needed. The third point is excellence in business. Now, we know that Paul wrote and he said, everything that you do, do unto the glory of God. Now, there's temporal benefits and spiritual benefits from this. If you're someone that's always doing your best at work, or for your customers. If you're going that extra mile, people pick it up. And, and that's where we should be. Because you will get your promotions. You will get an increase in salary. You will get an increase in influence. That's what we want. Is the influence that comes with it. But people notice the benefits that you are getting for someone that goes the extra mile. You make yourself indispensable. And that's what... Christians should do to gain influence in the workplace. Now, when you look at excellence in business, that might be uh, additional qualification, courses, but always strive to improve yourself so that you can serve others better, serve your family better. Every business, every practice, for example, in the hospital that I work at, there's a form of hierarchy. So we'll have the, the doctors in the middle and the nurses, You'll have management and senior management in the hospital groups. And then you'll have um, porters and you'll have cleaners that work alongside us. Now, the hierarchy is not a spiritual one. The hierarchy is what the world has created, either based on finances, either based on education, responsibility. But in God's or in heavenly currency, God sees us all of the same value. And it's very important that you understand that. The same way you greet the hospital manager as you're walking past is the same way that I should greet the porter. 
Use names. Use names. I'm always teaching my children. With a memory like mine, it's not always the best. But you make a point to memorize people's names, to use their names. Whether it be patients, whether it be cleaners, whether it be hospital managers. When you greet them, use their names. You'll see their faces light up. And that's what we need to do. God created relationships not for Christians to exploit for ministry. God created relationships for you to enrich your life. And the spin-off is that you'll have a, a sharper ministry, a mission at work. God expects us to take time to develop relationships. Hinder not these children to come unto me. Jesus, according to the disciples, wasted time spending time with his children. He wants you to waste time at work, not in idleness, but investing in relationship. And I say waste time with tongue in cheek because that's what the world wants us to think. But investing in relationship is what God wants from us. And I would encourage you. You know, this lockdown has been so good to me. I had a lot of time to pray over the December holidays. I was out in the bush in nature. And I really believe God told me to reduce my efficiency at work. Because with efficiency comes an intense amount of concentration, less smiling, and less relationship interaction. And then when the COVID crisis hit us, suddenly I was forced to be slower at work because of all the red tape, to do less in the same amount of time. And it's been the best thing ever for my relationships at work. And the relationships have allowed me the more time to, to minister to people and to be ministered to. Isn't it amazing how God works? God brings something great out of the crisis. And I really want to emphasize this point. Take time to invest in relationships at work and at family and in family. All right, let's look at sites. Now, one of my hobbies used to be, and still is, looking at scientific, scientific evidence for the Bible. In my workplace, for example, Patients have their surgery and I warn them before they go home that they must please take the medication as prescribed and not as they feel they need it. Because you always need to have the medication before the pain sets in. And I warn them that the first three days it's going to escalate in pain. And I'll say that recently they did beautiful studies where they showed on a biochemical level how this pain is generated. The response of your body to the surgery or trauma results in a cascade of elements, beautiful, beautiful science where prostaglandins and leukotrienes and these proteins come to start this healing process. But with this is the inflammation and this inflammation we try and suppress with medication. And I tell them, have you ever read that story about Dinah that went down to the woman in the valley, Jacob's, Jacob's daughter, and the incident that happened with her and the brothers then took vengeance on this town, but they waited for 72 hours, day three, when the pain would be the worst after the circumcision before they attacked. And it just shows you the credibility in one aspect, how the Bible is a very scientific book. There are many examples. I like to just shortly show credibility to the Bible. I've got a friend who knows his stars very well. And he shows from the book of Job how scientific the Bible is. There's so many examples and you should have a few that you can share wherever you get the opportunity to show credibility to the Bible. Do it. In prophecy, in science, in promises of the Bible, use it. Use one-liners, but share. Let people's mind get the truth about how awesome this book is, this Bible. All right. Then escalation. Now, Adele, my wife, shared this beautiful verse in Isaiah 28. In fact, the whole chapter is beautiful. It talks about the escalation of teaching. And it uses the analogy of a, a baby that comes off the breast or is weaned off breast milk. They don't stay on breast milk for the rest of their lives. They start eating soft foods and then solid foods. It talks about the farmer who plows the ground. He turns the ground upside down. He takes the clods, breaks the clods, and then... He evens the ground, plows it, and sows. You don't spend your whole season plowing. You have to sow. The thresher doesn't thresh only. 
he finally takes the wheat and grinds it. And it's the same with your mission, your mission at work. At some point, you have to escalate where God gives you wisdom in love, escalate from a level of truth to the next level. And that might be an invite. Invite someone from work and say, you know what, we've been working together for five years. Let's go and have a drink together. There's a nice coffee shop here. Let's go and sit together and tell me what is going on in your life. Tell me what you believe. I know that you're a Hindu or you're Muslim or you're a Christian of this denomination. Share with me what makes you tick. Let's spend some time together and let the Lord open doors. But most important, pray. If you see an option of missions at work, pray before you act. Prayer prepares the ground of the person's heart to receive the Holy Spirit. And it prepares you to not make mistakes and drop the baton. That brings me to the next point. Don't drop the baton. I'll show you how I dropped the baton recently. Every Friday morning, I'd go to the surgical ward at 7 o'clock where the nurses all hold hands and they sing the Lord's Prayer and some other songs in Zulu. Amazing experience. I'm so edified every time I go there. And I've developed these, these beautiful relationships with the porters and the sisters. And now with the COVID crisis, things were running late and I came into the ward and I was a little concerned. In fact, very concerned because... Another surgeon was going to follow me and I raised my voice and said, come, let's get this patient going. And I walked out of there feeling so bad. And I realized that the relationships that you build, that in times of crisis, if you are not anointed with the Holy Spirit the morning before you go to work, the Satan is going to create an opportunity where you're going to drop the baton and all the influence you've built over months and months and months for your ministry, for your missions at work is going to go by the way. You cannot leave home before you're anointed with the Holy Spirit. Power hour. Spend that thoughtful hour contemplating the life of Christ. And your life will be more like Him. The process of sanctification is essential for missions at work. I do not even need to mention secret sin in your life. There is no ways that you are going to be able to share the love of Christ if you have secret sin in your life. You need to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Be blessed by the Holy Spirit. So that you will have a free conscience. That you do not feel hypocritical when you share the love of Jesus. Our lives in the secret chamber of prayer is where missions at work begins. Make sure you have your personal spiritual revitalization every morning. Influence. There's a chain of command as we've discussed at work. A hierarchy. You need to improve your influence. Whichever way it may be, go to a friend's child's soccer match. Invite them over to your house for India functions. Get involved. Get involved. Invest time. The biggest investment you can make into improving your influence at work for missions is time. Spend time. This is something that's become very obvious to me in the last three months. As you can see, I'm harping on it all the time. And what I did realize is as soon as I started to invest time into people, into relationships, I know every level, people above me, people below me on this food chain that the world has created, God has blessed me. I've realized that this is what God intended. I thought of it as a way to achieve missions at work. And instead, God was doing missions in John because I am being edified by these relationships. Now, what a beautiful thing. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, and Jesus rushed. Slow down. Spend time with the children. Use their names. It's, uh, it's an amazing experience. So we've looked at the general principles. We'll just summarize them. We have a business. There's a need. Those needs are there to be fulfilled. Memorize promises. Just one-liners. It'll enrich people's lives. It'll give credit to the Bible. Excellence in business, always strive for excellence. Business. Go the extra mile. Even if you're not going to be even seen or noticed, do it. Because God will make sure someone sees it. And that will increase your influence in their lives tremendously. Escalation, don't get in a rut. Take it to the next level. Don't be too timid to take a chance. Can I pray for you? In the last six months, one person has said, no, thank you. Everyone else has said, yes, please, especially in a time of crisis. 
The door is wide open for us to offer. Can I pray for you? Don't drop the baton and influence. All right, let's have a look at ministering at work to other Christians who are of different denominations. We are very privileged in, in my workplace to have many people who love Jesus, who are saved, who I work with and I can share faith with, worshipping in, in different churches, the different denominations. The best thing that could have happened to me was what started as a small group um, fellowship. A few of us guys at the hospital joined together once a week, at 7 o'clock on a Thursday morning, just to pray together. Then we started a little Bible study together. Then businessmen started joining. The cardiologist said, oh, I've got a friend and this friend. And we've met the most amazing, intelligent, successful businessmen uh, of all walks of life and different denominations. It's been the greatest fellowship that I've had in my professional career. And I must say, I've been so edified. It's given me opportunities to witness what God has done in my life. And that's the probably the best thing is your personal testimony is to share. You don't have to color in all the dirty details. If you have of your past life, you can just mention it briefly. Don't give too much credit to the devil, but show what God has done to you. Tell, tell people what God has done for you. Small little things, whether it be your life's testimony, share. But start these small little groups. These small groups are amazing because it gives you opportunity to share what you believe. There's a word of caution here. Start a men's group. It's probably the easiest thing to do or a woman's group. It's more difficult when you mix the sexes because it's easier for men to talk about men's problems amongst themselves. That's the first point. The second point is you must see your missions in small groups as a sower. If you want to be a sower, you've got to get away from the mentality of evangelistic approach. So we learn from evangelists. I've, most of my Bible knowledge is from Bible study, which has been highlighted by spirit of prophecy and hearing qualified people expressing truths in different ways to me from the Bible. But when an evangelist stands up, he'll be able to give you a whole rendition of a specific doctrine, a whole Bible study, for example. When you are in small groups, you cannot do that. You have to get more into the mind of the sower, the parable of the sower. One seed at a time. One seed at a time. So there might be a conversation that goes towards a doctrine that you feel is not biblical, like election, where some people believe that God has chosen those who are going to be lost and those who are going to be saved, rather than God gives everyone equal opportunity and their choices determine their, their, their salvation. You might want to just quote a verse there. Don't expect to go into a whole theological study on that at that point in time. See yourself as a sower where God plants a little seed in your heart to share, share verse or share concept. Do it in a humble way and do not try to win a debate or to start a whole debate. See yourself as a so a little seeds of truth. When I see doctrines of a church, for example, the Seventh-day Adventist church that I grew up in, I believe that doctrines are very important. If you take God's character, false doctrines that aren't biblical are Satan's way of trying to mar God's character as a character of love. And we as Christians need to share God's love and correct any doctrines that take away the loving character of Christ and restore the character of love that God does have. Whether it be the state of the dead, election, once saved, always saved, even the Sabbath. Sabbath shows God's love to us and His compassion to us. And it's a sign that He sanctifies us. So we've got to memorize little verses and we just plant single seeds. If people want to know more and you sense that, Afterwards, go and speak to them and say, Look, why don't we have a study together? I'd like to know what you believe. Let's meet um, at a coffee shop for 15 minutes tomorrow afternoon, 3 o'clock. What do you say? As soon as you invite people to your house for a long Bible study, it's unlikely that's going to happen. I found a greater yield if you're going to meet someone informally in a place where you can have 15 minutes to share. Try that. That works better than inviting yourself to someone's house for a Bible study unless... It's reached a level where people want to know that.
But if it's something where you differ with someone about, keep it short and sweet. Season of prayer before you have that meeting and preparation. Remember, show yourself approved. Study to show yourself approved, Paul said to Timothy. And that's what we need to do. We need to study before the time and humbly present truths and be ready to receive truths. There are many times that I've been edified by people that believe differently to me. That brings me to another point. Faith is not knowledge. Make sure you understand you are not there with superior knowledge to convert people. Faith is completely different to knowledge as well. I've met people in other churches who have a, a vastly greater knowledge of the Bible than I do. I've met a lot of people with stronger faith than I have. And that has, that's edified me. We have a, a, a man in our group, very successful businessman, who used to be a Hindu. And he will come in and say, I had someone come into my business and I saw he had a problem and I sat him down there and I shared Jesus to him. And he saved. And I, I was just absolutely amazed. I went with these men into the bush for a weekend getaway. We shared our lives, testimonies, 12 men sitting around this big table. Unbeknown to us, the people working in this game lodge were listening and finally started joining us, sharing their testimonies of their life and how they wanted Jesus in their life after hearing what they've done for us. And I personally gave my testimony to by Sunday afternoon, the long weekend over there, three people from that lodge were baptized in the swimming pool by friends in that group. And they gave their hearts to Jesus, they were baptized into Christ. An amazing story. Do you know, to be edified by these people has been a great experience to me. So don't go with an agenda. Go there to be edified. Ask people to pray for you, even if they have different churches. People that come week after week in a busy schedule, they take time out to come and worship and, and fellowship with you. Those men are making big effort. Those are men that God loves. Their hearts, their hearts are in service to the Lord. The prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Ask him to pray for you and your family and you'll be blessed. Ask him to pray for the ministry. Ask them to pray for the men of your group or the women that we will all have a heart of love for the truth so that we can be prevented from falling prey to deception, as Thessalonians talks about. So we've talked about small group fellowship. We've talked about sowing seeds, not trying to win theological debates. We can't resolve doctrinal disputes during a fellowship session. Faith is not knowledge. Be prepared to be edified and your faith strengthened by your, your friends in other, other churches. And then remember escalation. Now, escalation in doctrine is very difficult in these circumstances. It's best one-on-one. -on -one. But escalation in prophecy is beautiful. If you look at how God identifies himself in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the spirit of prophecy is a testament of Jesus. If you look at the Old Testament in Isaiah 46, he says, who is like me? Who can tell the end from the beginning? That's his fingerprint, is prophecy. You can use prophecy as a springboard. You know there are many churches out there that believe that Daniel and Revelation is a closed book. Use little catchy stories. Do you know, for example, that the Bible predicts exactly when Jesus would, be, would die? Uh, almost 500 years before, and you can go into the 70-week prophecy. The 70-week prophecy has been misinterpreted. Uh, in recent years, and we can start off with reformers, what they believed, and then show from the Bible how it is true and how to identify the little horn when it gets to that place. But you need a stepwise, prudent approach to that. You don't jump straight into that. One story that I love uh, is to, to awaken the appetite for prophecy that got me hooked on studying God's word and understanding his, his prophetic value and for the times that we're living in and for my life personally was the story of Cyrus. You know the story of Cyrus, you can share that with someone. How this young boy, his grandson was the king uh, during the, the, the Mede and Persian, well, mainly the Medes were, were reigning over the Persians who were the, the, uh, the shepherds or the lower class of society. And the grandfather had a dream that his grandson, who was still an infant, would rise up one day and take his throne. 
So he ordered the assassination of his grandson. One of the generals had to take him into the desert. And maybe some of you know the story where the shepherd came along and the general couldn't do the, the murder. The shepherd took the child home and brought the clothes back covered in blood. As you can imagine, the shepherd didn't have any children and they raised Cyrus up. One day as the king was passing through, he saw the shepherd boy selling sheep and he realized that this was his grandson. The general had to flee, found Cyrus and led him to power and he became the king. Now what's special about this is that the Cyrus cylinder that has been found, and I've seen it in the museum, is the first human rights charter. And everyone wants to know about human rights these days. And this is an amazing thing because when he came to power, he didn't go and ask the Medes and take all their property. He brought together the Medo-Persian Empire and he showed respect to both groups. Different religions that he conquered, he showed respect to the people and allowed them to co-reign with him. What an amazing story. And this was prophesied how he would enter Babylon, how he would defeat the kings and find great treasure. You quote some of these verses and you tell the story. It's, it's an amazing story. And you're giving credibility to prophecy and to the Bible. There are many others. Uh, for the sake of time, we'll have to leave that out. But um, I would encourage you to, to look at prophecy and find, and, well, Daniel 11. There's so many stories there. Julius Caesar, Mark Anthony, Cleopatra. You can show, tell a few stories and say, you know, that that's in the Bible. And um, Daniel 11, we're busy working on a series now to show from a men's perspective how the wars played in and fulfilled the scenarios to bring Daniel 11 uh, to fruition. And if you find a few little stories like this as you study, use that to spark conversation and to encourage people. So to summarize this first session, we looked at general principles on missions at work. We've looked at small group fellowships with other Protestant non-Adventist Christians so that you can be edified and that you can share the pearls of truth that you have from, from a lifetime of Bible study in the workplace. The biggest and most important thing is your relationship with the Lord. If you are not spending quality time because you're so successful, so efficient at work, and you're rushing out of your house with one hand on the doorknob, one hand on a Bible verse, a relationship with the Lord will not give you successful missions at work. You need to delight yourself in the Lord. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving in your heart. Move through the sanctuary during your worship study in the morning. Claim the promises that the Lord has given to successfully allow you to witness for Him. We are called to be ambassadors, and what an important time in world's history. What a door is open with this COVID crisis, where there's a crisis, people become more spiritual. People want to hear. People want you to pray for them. Be bold. Ask them, may I pray for you? I promise you, most people at this point in time in their lives will say yes. Pray, pray, pray. Pray at home. Pray at work and God will open the doors for your missions to be successful. God bless and we'll see you for the second session.